story of both a personal pursuit of science as well as that of a discovery that was made by a collaboration of scientists around the world that has been changing our understanding of the universe. This story starts with a very faint whoop. We will hear this sound shortly. What you just heard was the sound of black holes colliding. Now this might have caught your attention just about a year ago. Newspapers around the world showcased photographs of Einstein and the common theme of Einstein hat recht, Einstein was right. This appeared in papers from Germany to Spain, from the New York Times to our more local Clarion Ledger. Just what was it that Einstein was right about? After all, Einstein has been proven correct many times before. Only four years after he published his general theory of relativity in 1915, he was launched to being a pop star. Scientists at the time made an observation. They saw that starlight that passed close to the sun was bent, its path was not straight. This was precisely as Einstein had predicted it should be. This announcement of Einstein was right, which came the day before these newspaper headlines appeared, was made by Dave Wrightsey. He said, we have detected gravitational waves. We did it. So Einstein was right about the existence of gravitational waves, which you can think of as ripples in space-time. Now, Dave Wrightsey is the director of the LIGO laboratory and also my PhD advisor. LIGO is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Together with hundreds of other experimentalists around the world, we help design and build the gravitational wave detectors that recorded the sound of black holes colliding. We'll come back to more about me later, but first, Let's return to the black holes in Einstein. Einstein is one of these rare single minds whose curiosity managed to change fundamentally the way that we understand our world. What he told us is that space and time are not individual ideas. They are, in fact, intricately connected in an intertwined web known as space-time. Now, when objects, when matter, such as the Earth or a black hole or our sun, move around in this space-time, they disturb the space-time, and they create ripples, much like what you would see if you were to toss a pebble into a pond. These emanating ripples are the gravitational waves. Now, these gravitational waves are extremely challenging to detect. What we see here is that as these black holes are rotating about one another, they get closer and closer together as they lose energy in the form of gravitational waves. The light green regions is where space-time is getting stretched, and the dark green regions is where it's getting compressed. These black holes move faster and faster, creating gravitational waves of ever larger amplitude and frequency until they form one new, larger black hole. Now, this movie here is just a simulation what we actually observed is this data that follows. This is a time series showing how the gravitational wave came through our detectors, increasing in amplitude and in frequency. We observed the final 150 milliseconds before the black holes collided. There were two independent observatories that caught this wave, and their data matches perfectly. These black holes each weighed about 30 times the mass of the sun. And when they were traveling at just about the speed of light, that's when they collided. This is an enormous amount of energy that was released in the form of gravitational waves. Had the form of the energy been instead visible light that one could see with your own eyes, this collision would have produced a flash 
that would outshine the light from all of the stars in the universe combined. Now, I started my endeavor as a researcher in science as an undergraduate. I worked at Vassar College as an undergrad during my very first summer after my freshman year. I learned through a series of these summer research programs what it meant to be a physicist, that being a physicist could mean several different things. I first learned how to model physical processes, such as the fluid dynamics of stars to understand what happens when they collide. I then went on to Cornell, where I learned how to analyze data from a particle accelerator. And in my third summer, I got involved in experimental work. And this is when I discovered that experimental work was what suited me best. And that's what I went on to do for my PhD. Now, this story is just one example of the hundreds are, that are out there of other experimentalists like me who came to work on this project. The LIGO Scientific Collaboration is a collaboration of over 1,000 scientists from over 70 different institutions around the world, ranging from small liberal arts colleges to mid-sized universities like Ole Miss to renowned institutions. And the need for all of these scientists working together to make this discovery is because the discovery itself was an extremely challenging thing to accomplish. Gravitational waves, by the time that they reach the Earth, are very, very small. So what is it exactly that the gravitational waves do when they reach the Earth? In this movie, we see an exaggerated effect, whereas the gravitational waves come up from the southern hemisphere. They pass through the Earth and alternately stretch it in one while shrinking it in the other. And then that process reverses. This exaggerated effect here of the shrinking and stretching of the Earth, the relative size of this shrinking to the size of the Earth, the strain, is of the order, or let's say it's about one-tenth. However, the strain from gravitational waves, from these black holes that collided, was 10 to the minus 21. This is an extremely tiny number. The way that we would need to measure this extremely tiny number is by building some of the most precise rulers ever developed that were not in existence to date. It would be equivalent to needing to measure a change in the distance from us to the nearest star of less than the width of a human hair. So this precision of needing to build such detectors has a long history and dates back to the 1960s with Joseph Weber at the University of Maryland. Weber, with his insight into the problem, designed the first gravitational wave detector. He built a cylinder which would ring much like a bell when a gravitational wave passes through. By the end of the 1960s, Weber claimed to have made a detection. This prompted others around the world, from the UK to Germany to Italy to elsewhere in the US, to build detectors much like Weber's. But they didn't see anything. And before long, the conclusion of the scientific community was that Weber must have been wrong. Now, this pushed the field forward, however. The curiosity of those to actually detect a gravitational wave persisted. Who knows what might have happened had he not made this false detection. The technology that developed as a result of this pursuit to measure gravitational waves was the laser interferometer. And groups around the world began to develop this and perfect it. A laser interferometer is a device with which we can measure very small changes in the distance between two mirrors. And the laser Interferometer is made of a beam splitter, laser, two end mirrors. As the light, which we model as a wave, travels down these two arms, the beam splitter sending some light one direction, other light the other direction, causes the light to recombine back at the beam splitter where it experiences either destructive or constructive interference 
as the gravitational wave passes through. The result is a changing pattern of light and dark spots on the photodetector, information which tells us about the gravitational wave. The gravitational wave detectors, the laser interferometers, are much more complicated than what you see here. One problem is that you can't simply put these mirrors on the ground or on a table. The Earth, after all, is an extremely noisy place. You don't feel it in your everyday lives, but it's moving a lot from this perspective, from seismic activity, from human activity, cars driving over bumps down the road. We need to reduce the motion of these mirrors compared to that on the Earth by over a factor of a billion. And the way that we do so is by hanging them as pendulum, much like what you would find in your grandfather's clock. These pendula that are used at LIGO, for instance, are not only consisting of a mirror with string, but it's a mirror suspended by another mass, suspended by another mass, suspended by another mass. This quadruple suspension was a project which several institutions around the world worked to design and build. Now, we need to not only protect the mirrors from the motion of the Earth beneath them, but also from other environmental factors like wind. We place them in vacuum tanks. The molecules in the air affect not only the mirrors, but also the laser beam itself. So these vacuum tanks and tubes exist along the entire stretch of the interferometer arms, which in the case of LIGO is four kilometers, or about two and a half miles. Now, this is not the only detector. There is a network around the world. We have this one here in, nearby in Livingston, Louisiana. The other in Washington State were the two LIGO detectors that made this detection last year. But others are being built in Italy, in Japan, and there will be one that's built in India as well. I myself spent a total of seven years working at both the Livingston and the German detectors. One of my contributions has to do with this fact that we need to protect the mirrors from moving due to anything other than gravitational waves. One problem is that the laser light that we use in the interferometers is very powerful. And this light itself, as it is reflected off of the mirrors, it pushes on the mirrors and can cause them to come out of orientation with respect to one another and be misaligned. I worked on a scheme to correct this misalignment. So my project, along with many others, is to look towards the future of the field, to hear a University of Mississippi, we have built up a lab which involves both undergraduates and graduate students to build technology for the next generation of detectors. After all, we want to be able to detect signals not just once every few months, but to detect dozens per day. And in order to do this, it requires us pushing the limits of technology. And doing so requires a community of scientists around the world to achieve this goal. And as we do so, and as we build the next generation of detectors, which might look like this one here, they might be underground, much longer, and possibly tuned to hear different tones of the sounds coming from space. As we build this network of future detectors, we'll get closer and closer to being able to hear all of the sounds from the universe. Our current best guess of what that might sound like one day is this.
done is not only opened up a new way of looking at the universe, we have detected gravitational waves. We can now not only see what is out there in the universe with our eyes or from other wavelengths of light, but we now have ears. We can listen to the universe. And every time in the past that some new astronomy has been developed, something unexpected has been found. Who knows what we might find next? Thank you.